Okay, let me make sure my laser pointer is working. So I'm going to talk about time series analysis, and I'm going to talk about time series classification. Um, the application is to IT operations analytics, which is the analysis of IT operations data, monitoring data, like your CPU usage, your network usage, how much memory is being used. Um, my name is Rohit, Rohit Chatterjee. I went from computer science to math, and then I liked math more than math liked me, so I got out of math and moved over to finance. Then I got tired of stealing people's pension funds, and so I came back to software. And now I'm a data scientist at Microland. Microland does IT operations management, and uh, I'm building predictive systems to forecast problems and classify them and suggest auto remediation. Um, IT operations, uh, IT systems are monitored continuously. Continuously doesn't really mean continuously. It's like every five minutes, every 15 minutes, depending on the performance indicator that you're looking at, depending on the uh, importance that that indicator has. Well, uh, one also wants to look at log data. Um, if any of you attended the Sumo Logic talks yesterday, then you're somewhat familiar with what's done in that area. And these are what the time series look like. As you can see, they don't look like stock data. They're not very noisy. It's not a Brownian motion around a mean regressive, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this one on the, whoops. This one on the top left, whoa, this jumped. Beg your pardon is the most complicated out of these four. And these other three are really quite representative. They're simple graphs. You can describe them using words very easily. You're not, I'm not trying to discover some highly complex behavior over here. What I do want to do is I want to automatedly classify them so that, um, so that I can take action. So the challenge is to, is to classify things which are not terribly complicated. In order to classify, I need features. So this entire talk is going to be about extracting features from these types of graphs. Once one has features, one can plug them into you know, your various statistical methods, your machine learning methods. I'm not going to talk about any of that. Once you have built models, you want to push them into your real-time systems, your Lambda architectures. I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm only going to talk about how to pull features out of these time series, which are useful for the problem of pattern uh, recognition. So you want patterns. You start off looking at some obvious ones. OK, take a mean variance, peak to peak. Turns out these are not terribly useful. And uh, the reason, I'll just give you a simple example of why not. Um, if you look at the means and variances of these two graphs, and then you look at you know, their ratio, that coefficient of variation or whatever, they're the same, but the graphs are different. So you're not going to get very far with just looking at the mean and the variance. The, the problem is that the distribution by itself is just is not really aware of time. So if you want to approach this from that point of view, then you need to do something like, you know, what is the value at a at a time t conditioned on the last 10 observations you saw, and you build big conditional distributions. Well, I didn't want to do that, because it sounds complicated. So I looked at the mode. The mode is a very neglected statistic. It never comes up anywhere, probably because you can't pull it out of distributions easily. So let me remind you, the mode is the most frequently occurring value in a sample. If you look at the graph on the left, you see that the mode is around 0 0.08. And for um, you know, continuous data, it's not a single value. It's a small interval. So my mode is actually between here and here. And you can see that uh, most of the values of this graph are in this little interval. And so this particular graph has a single mode. The graph on the right, on the other hand, has two modes. There's one up here at 1.6 billion, and at 800 million, there's a second one. So I'm now going to 
take the modes, and I'm going to use these two graphs for a couple slides to explain, to illustrate a few of the features I'm going to pull out. So here's my first feature, I call it the strength. So the strength of the mode is the uh, proportion of the occurrences of that mode in your, in your window. So the first, the, the only mode on the left-hand graph occurs basically around 100% of the time. So this is a very strong mode, its strength is one. Whereas on the second graph, each mode has a strength of 0.5. So the strength is my first statistic that I'm interested in, which I'm going to use to build up my, my signature. So the strength is my first feature. My second feature is what I call the run ratio. I apologize, I'm terrible at naming things. Uh, the run ratio looks at the longest unbroken string of values that lie in that mode. The longest consecutive run. So this one is around 80%. You see there are two, run, two runs. This one is smaller, so I take the bigger one. And so for this particular graph, the run ratio of this mode is 0.8. On the right-hand graph, the run ratio of this mode is 100% because of all occurrences of this mode, they all appear in a consecutive run. So 100% of occurrences of mode, of this upper mode, are in a consecutive run. And the same for the lower mode. And if you find that unsatisfying because you, you can see that this is half of the graph, well, okay, so I have another statistic. Which, which precisely looks at the proportion uh, of the longest consecutive road with respect to the entire window. Um, so let's look at what this does for us. Here are two graphs with uh, a mode at around zero. And these are strong modes, 98%. But the run ratio is able to distinguish between the two. A lot of the times your graphs are not going to have a mode, and then what do you do? Well, this is not a terribly difficult problem because you can apply a difference operator, which is, you know, you take adjacent values and you subtract the previous one from the current one, and you form a different series. And so if you apply the difference operator to this slope over here, you get this graph over here. And as you can see, this different series is now very amenable, amenable to this modal analysis I just described. There's a mode at around 30,000. And uh, in fact, you can see some periodicity in the non-modal parts. I'm not going to talk about periodicity today. But you, you will see structure when you perform a differencing operation. Here's a step, step function. Also um, works well with the differencing operator. The mode is now at around zero. You've got runs. You can describe it using the, the run ratio and the run strength and the modal strength. And the, I, I want to point out that the, differing, the differencing operator is useful because you can recover the original series from it. If you have a starting value, then you take cumulative sums of the difference series. You recover the original series. So you're not losing information. So it's, it's not like you're throwing away a lot of stuff by stepping from one to the other. So you do all this, and then now you can come up with a signature. And the signature is my goal. I wanted a way to represent my graph in a way that uh, can be plugged into standard statistical and machine learning methods. So I've talked about, um, I should have ordered this differently. Let me start here in the middle. This is the, for, for this particular signature, this is the mode, the run ratio, run ratio, and the parent, the strength, um, I also look at the non-modes, because sometimes you get information from the non-modes. The non-mode is the part of the series which is not contained in any of the modes. So I look at the run ratios over there. Uh, this GT ratio is useful. The GT stands for greater than. So if you, if you have a mode, then you, you want to know whether your non-modal values lie above or below. You count which proportion of them lie above, and that is what I call the GT ratio. The GT ratio of 1 indicates that all of them lie above. So for instance, if your mode is 0, then all of your non-modal values lie above your mode. And now you have a big signature. Let me recap, remind you, 
where the signature came from, we had a performance counter and we had a window. So a single window gives you a, a signature. Now you want to move your window for the same performance counter. And some of these values obviously will change. But you expect that they're going to move within a little range. And so, f like for example, your D more GT ratio might be between 0.75 and 0.83. I don't know. But now, since you've moved the window and you've made signatures, you have, for this particular performance counter, you have a little, you have a part of a vector space where, which describes this performance counter. And so if you plug this into a real-time system and you're observing your performance counter, you can calculate you can calculate the whole signature, but that's kind of slow. You can calculate components at a time and see if any of them lie outside your expected range. And then you can trigger an anomaly quickly over there. You can then calculate more values, and you can see if you've seen this before. If you've seen it before, could you connect it to an incident that occurred? An incident for non-ITIL people is you know, a problem that happened in the past. And then can you connect it to a resolution that maybe happened, so that you can either suggest a resolution to your engineers quickly, or even better, if you can trigger an automated remediation script to fix it. Plugging, I, I left this slide blank because I'm just going to talk now. Plugging this into a real-time system uh, involves Basically, you've got, you've got all these features for your signature, and you have to figure out for each performance counter which features are going to be your decision makers. And so for each performance counter, you need to know in which order to compute these features so that you don't waste time computing, fe computing features which are not going to give you information. So this part is a work in progress. Once uh, this is done, then I can plug this into a real-time system, and then I'm going to see how well it works. Right now, I've thrown the, um, this algorithm at a bunch of historical data, and it distinguishes between different graphs very nicely. You know, it says this is a flat graph, and then 10 of them are flat graphs, and it puts all the sloping graphs together. It puts all the sporadically spiking graphs together. So I believe that the, that the method works well for pattern recognition. Um, next year, hopefully I'll come back and I'll be able to give you results on how well this works in production. Thank you. Ready for some questions? Go ahead. All right. A uh, couple, uh, couple of them, actually. So uh, the first one, um, how many, uh, so you mentioned about like if you do not see the pattern in the, in the uh, vanilla time series, you do the differentiation, uh, difference, right? So uh, do you have an, uh, this thing about how many times you might need to difference before you, uh, or you keep doing difference till you see a pattern? Or? So absolutely, that's a great question. The question is, how many times do you need to apply the difference operator before you can then look at the other features of the series. So I expect it to have to apply it more than once, but so far I have not needed to apply it more than once. OK. The, so the difference operator, if you come from some kind of ARIMA background or whatever. That, that's exactly right, what exactly. I was, uh, I was right. uh, leading to, that uh, if it can be tied to some of the ARIMA sort of. Uh, right. OK. So I haven't needed to difference more than once yet. OK. Right. okay. So that's the first one. Second one is that uh, can this be uh, some of these ideas be used for shorter, I mean, non-high frequency uh, data, like uh, you know, some of the business uh, time series data that we see. This is sales for uh, per quarter or per day or those kind of stuff. They're not high frequency, so. Right. Uh, so my approach to data which is not appearing at regular time intervals is that what you should, inst what you should do is you should look at the series of the differences between the, the inter-event spacing. So when events happen, you count that, and you count, OK, it was one day, five days, or whatever, and you make your time series of those differences, one, five, seven, right, et cetera. Right. And then you try and apply methods to that. I see. And I'm, uh, uh, I'm assuming that you are not really looking at predictions, right? Like pardon? the time series forecasting side of things. I will not the forecasting looking. side of things. Um, Predi so I have different methods for, for predictions. I right now do not have a plan to 
So what one could do is you could say, okay, given this vector, which vector does it predict? And then you can look forward that way. I, but I will have to make it computationally feasible. Uh, one question here. Where do yes. you stand up, wave your hand? It's here. Uh, Hello. Hi. Uh, let's say you have a uh, time series signal where you have an upward trend. And then the modal distribution that you're talking about, the mode will go on changing as you go on upward trend on a lower trend. Then in that cases, how does your, uh, uh, it work? I mean, I believe the mode will change if it's an upward trend in the signal. Then so I, right now I'm only dealing with trend lines by applying that differencing operator. So if it's a straight trend, then the single order difference will work. If you have some kind of convexity or something, you might have to do it more than once. So far, I have not needed to. And one uh, follow-up question. I mean, feature extraction, normally in time series, people use Fourier transforms or Weber transforms to get the features. And then plug those features. And uh, have you tried anything like that? I have not tried anything like that. I had the idea. Then I thought that this was easier. OK, thank you. Go ahead. There's that microphone is uh, coming right up. Jesse, just tell me when I should stop. OK, good. Uh, uh, quick points. Uh, when you're talking about the time differences and taking the modes and the statistical features that you derived, uh, is there a specific time period that you're looking at, or are you flexing it, the window, as you go? That's the first one. Second, is your end objective doing prediction? Uh, and the third one really is that a lot of the times you would have a, a, a signature uh, of any sort actually related, meaning if something happened in time t0, I would expect in general something to happen in time tn. That's right. So how are you handling that? Because in my mind, if you capture both of those, it is basically deterministic and it can lead to multicollinearity in the old statistical learning methodology. So and the, the second and third questions sorry, are kind uh, of related. Just final one is that, are you, what are you trying to predict? Are you trying to predict that if there are five systems interconnected and something happened in one and two, it will have an effect on system three? Or is it that just like in one environment, if something ha uh, X, Y, Z happened, then what would it lead to? So I'll answer your questions backwards. Um, your final question, the answer to your final question is both. Because if I just have a series of you know, time series, then I don't necessarily need to segregate them by where they came from. Of course, in practice, I might want to. But uh, generically, I. I'm happy to find out um, relationships across systems as well as within a system, maybe application to database, maybe how th that affect on the disk. Your second and third questions had to do with prediction. And uh, so if I can figure out how to make this fast, because as you can see, it's probably not so uh, quick to compute this signature, then what I would like to say is I would like to say uh, on the last two hours I've seen pattern A100, and then I have an 85% chance of seeing pattern B231 over the next two hours. And B231 might be a good pattern, in which case I'll say, fine, I'm happy. Or it might be a pattern which is going to give us an advanced notification of a problem, in which case I would need to do something. Uh, for your first question, the length of your window, that depends on the performance counter itself. Certain counters like whatever CPU usage uh, you want to pay attention to faster. Certain counters you might want to look at longer periods. In fact, I shouldn't even say that CPU is necessarily a short-term window because um, you have long-term patterns on CPU as well. So if you, if you do some kind of smoothing, you might even want to look at a 10 or 15 hour window. Okay, I think I'm done for time. We can talk later if anyone else has any more. Thank you.